What they're gonna do here is the same thing they've always done is they printed a bunch of money that caused all this fraud because people threw their money at something they thought was gonna make them rich. It ended up being fraud. And they're gonna come in with a bunch of regulations. They're gonna nationalize it, institutionalize it, and allow the fraud to continue. They're gonna adopt some of the stable coins and they're gonna adopt the CBDC. And they're gonna push it on everybody and it's still gonna be fraud, but it'll be done officially through the government and the government will have the monopoly on that one too. Like say three months from now, inflation 0%. That does not mean that my case of eggs is going to come down whatsoever, correct? So right. they, can, they can print this right. money, inflation goes up, everybody freaks out about it. If they just start printing money, inflation goes to zero because they lie and they manipulate how inflation is calculated. In order for prices to come down and things to get cheaper again, you need deflation to happen. What else is gonna come from them continuously raising interest rates besides just complete chaos in the economy? Man, such an honor to always have you on the show, Joe. You have so much knowledge and I just can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Now, when we talk about, I've heard you talk quite a few times about the Federal Reserve being the, the lender of last resort, right? So when banks are committing, when the smaller banks were committing fraud, they were taking out your money, they were lending it out using fractional reserve banking. And then when people came to the banks to withdraw their cash, they didn't have it. So then we basically created the Federal Reserve. If I'm saying this right, and I want you to re-say it so everybody can understand. In crypto, what we saw with FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried was everybody went to call their money and the plus side to it was we could all see on the blockchain. So we were watching, you know, how is FTX trading Bitcoin right now when it's showing that they have zero Bitcoin on their exchange? And we were watching this happen in real time. And that's what really, I think, started to trigger everybody and watching all of that money leave the exchange. Well, we can't do that with banks. And Sam Bankman Fried was bailing out these companies. And then it comes to find out he wasn't bailing them out because he wanted to be the knight in shining armor. He was bailing them out was because his, they were going to take down his, his Ponzi scheme. They were going to expose his Ponzi scheme. So anybody watching this, if you guys thought Sam Bankman Fried and FTX was bad and what he was doing because he had, he was the market maker and he was the exchange, Digital Currency Group is a $90 billion business. They have a $2.6 billion hole in their balance sheet. Don't quote me on these numbers. Digital Currency Group is invested in and I believe owns enough stake in to dictate how these exchanges operate. I want to say at least seven if not 10 different exchanges. They also are heavily invested in if they do not own a market maker. They also own Coindesk, which is the largest crypto media outlet. They also own Chain Analysis. So we know that the FBI was working, was infiltrating school boards. They were reclassifying how they, how investigations played out so that this statistics could be in their favor. So the FBI was basically faking statistics. And then they were taking those fake statistics and saying, hey, we need these regulations because of these statistics. So you look at it, somebody like Digital Currency Group, they own the exchanges, they own the media outlets, they own the borrowing and lending protocols, they own the analytic company. So the government in the, in the 2021 Chain Analysis Crypto Crime Report, which is all the regulators use and they always you know reference statistics from this analysis report where i went through the report and i was like where where is this collapse where was this ponzi scheme i'm not seeing anything about these in here so it's like digital currency group was literally creating creating reports and you know manipulating the statistics and then those statistics are being given to regulators and then all of these exchanges are paying lobbyists and they're making big donations to these political campaigns would any regulations that they could have placed put in place prevented that because that's that's kind of like crypto can't go anywhere when the Ponzi scheme's that big and there's that much monopoly over the system. So I'm not saying that we don't need any regulations, but even if we had the best regulations, could you prevent those things from happening? No, the best way to prevent those things from happening is a complete lack of regulations. And I'll explain why. So we have, uh, we start off with gold coins as money. People are trading gold coins. At some point, uh, well, okay, so because of that, you have deflation over time because in an economy, let's say you've got 10 gold coins and over time you build more houses, you figure out ways to grow better food, faster, more food, food becomes more abundant, shoes become more abundant, horses become more abundant. So you grow the amount of wealth, but the money supply stayed the same. There's still 10 gold coins. And so as you're trading, now there's less money compared to all of the stuff. And so that money is more valuable compared to all the stuff. That means that money is cheaper, less valuable compared to the money. And so there's deflation over time when the money supply stays the same because the growth of wealth happens regardless. And so in that system, it started off where you slapped down a gold coin and that was enough to buy lunch. And then over time, you slapped down a gold coin and that's enough for a down payment on a house or a horse. And so people didn't want to carry around gold coins anymore because it's too valuable. And so you need somewhere to store it uh, and you don't want to travel with it. You might get, they get, get it stolen from you. And so people looked to 
goldsmiths, the original banks, to hold their gold for them. And so they gave them the gold and said, uh, give me a piece of receipt that says, you know, I, I can come back and get my gold at any time. And so they did that. And instead of trading the gold, now they're trading the paper for, uh, for money instead. And that works fine. There's no fraud there. The fraud happens when the uh, bank looks down, says, we've got a bunch of gold in storage here. Everybody's just trading the paper now. Nobody's coming to redeem that paper for gold. So I'm going to, instead of just being a savings institution, I'm also going to start being a loans institution. So they say, if anybody wants a loan, they can come get it from me. And so somebody comes. And before they were like, you know, let's say 3% was the going interest rate. They had to borrow from Aunt Sally. That means Aunt Sally has to actually give up her money to uh, loan to uh, little Johnny. And so there's no change in the money supply when a loan takes place. But now I'm the bank and I've got a bunch of gold. And so I say, hey, you can come borrow from me at 2 percent because it's free money for me i'm literally printing it and so i don't care if it's under the market rate i'll undercut everybody and i'll get all the loan business so if somebody comes to me gets a loan for two percent i write them the same piece of paper that everybody uses for money that says at any time you can come get a piece of gold from me and so at that moment fraud has taken place i've given everybody a piece of paper that says at any moment you can come to me and get this much gold it's a contract and it is not fulfillable if everybody comes at the same time and gets it from me well eventually in this system i keep on printing money and i'm getting rich and then everybody realizes something's going on and so everybody comes and tries to get their gold and there's not enough there's a bank run the moment the bank run happens not a single one of those people will ever be a victim of a bank run ever again because suddenly they just lost money and so next time around they're gonna make damn sure that the gold is actually there and the person who perpetrated the fraud will never run a bank again who in their right mind would allow that person who has proven himself to be unreliable to hold on to somebody's money it never would happen again who in their right mind today would give money to Sam Bankman Freed to manage it for them? Zero people, except maybe Kevin O'Leary. Yeah, Who I'm in man. their right mind today <laughs> would give their money to uh, Bernie Madoff to invest for them? Zero people. Nobody is going to do that. Guess how many uh, complaints and tips were submitted for Bernie Madoff? There were dozens of them. Everybody was suspicious of this guy and we're saying something's going on. There's fraud here. The regulatory agencies did jack shit. They did nothing, did nothing to stop that from happening for the longest time. The only reason why it started to uh, unravel is because the economy started to collapse and he couldn't, uh, he couldn't keep on going anymore. And so the reality is when you print a bunch of money, which all Ponzi's and big frauds have taken place during times of easy money. Uh, go back and look at all, all the major ones like Bernie Madoff and Sam Bankman Freed and Enron and, and even Charles Ponzi, the original one. They print a bunch of money. All that new money is looking for a way to make money. And so fraud comes out of the woodworks and says, give it to me. I'll make you tons of money. And people just buy into it because might as well, because they're promising returns better than everything. And inflation is going to eat it away. And so people look like they're getting rich left and right. And so I'm going to go for it. I'm not going to do my due diligence and I'm not going to worry about the red flags because it looks like everybody's getting rich. So all that money piles into frauds and then eventually it collapses. And so on the back of that, instead of saying, uh, hey, we printed money. The result of that was a bunch of fraud. So we should never print money again. Again, what they do is they say, we're going to come up with all these new laws and regulations. And they don't, this is the key thing. They don't outlaw that fraud from happening. All they do is nationalize it. So when the bank runs happened, they didn't outlaw fractional reserve banking, which is fraud. They nationalized it and said, if you want to be a bank, we're going to have a federal reserve now and you have to have a banking license and you can still participate in the fraud. You can still do fractional reserve banking. It just has to be official now. And so all you do is then you transfer all that risk to the entire system. And within seven years of the Federal Reserve being created, we had the first Great Depression in 1920. And then nine years after that, we had the second Great Depression in 1929. And that one lasted for decades. And it's remembered as the Great Depression because it ended up being worse than the first one because the government tried to save it instead of just letting it resolve itself like the first time. And so what they're going to do here is the same thing they've always done is they printed a bunch of money that caused all this fraud because people threw their money at something they thought was going to make them rich. It ended up being fraud. Then they're going to come in with a bunch of regulations. They're going to nationalize it, institutionalize it, and allow the fraud to continue. They're going to uh, adopt some of the stable coins, and they're going to adopt a CBDC, and they're going to push it on everybody. And it's still going to be fraud, but it'll be done officially through the government, and the government will have the monopoly on that one too. Man, I had such a good, I had such a good follow up there for that one, and then I started going down a different rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> That was a really good one. Damn, I, I, so explain to me right now. So I'll come back to that one. So the 
when the economy and the Fed right now has full control over the economy because they have the ability to print and they also have the ability to take money out of supply, right? That's what they're trying to do with the re and with the reverse repo right now is if I'm saying this right, these big banks and these big institutions, they can take their capital, park it in the reverse repo and they earn, is it 4.5% interest over, is it every day they're earning 4.5% interest or is that yearly? That's yearly. That's the yearly amount. And so, yeah, the banks have uh, requirements for how much collateral they need to keep versus their liabilities. And so uh, uh, in 2019, everybody needed cash. They had a lot of collateral, no, no cash. And so they all went to each other and said, hey, I need cash. And nobody had it. So that's when the Fed had to uh, start injecting cash. Now, right now, the, the problem is that there's a lot of cash because we printed a few trillion dollars and injected that into the banking system. Because when that money in goes into the economy, all that means is that it goes into somebody's bank account. It goes into the government's bank account. They spend it. goes into a politician's bank account, a military contractor's bank account, a veteran's bank account, Social Security's uh, retiree's bank account. And then when they spend it, it goes into a business's bank account. And then the business will spend it or use it as a paycheck for somebody it goes so it's all going into people's bank accounts is the is is what i'm getting at there and so right now there's a lot of cash so that means banks need a lot of collateral uh so where do they get that collateral they can buy t-bills off the open market but that will push rates down and the fed is trying to push rates up because uh rates uh and bond prices are inversely correlated and so uh they're uh instead of doing that the Federal Reserve opened up the reverse repo facility. So banks say, we've got all this cash, we need collateral. So I'm going to give the cash to the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve will then give me the collateral that I need. And at some point, whenever I need to, we can swap back. And the amount they're getting paid for that is, yeah, like four and a half percent right now. It's just over the bottom band of the federal funds rate, five basis points over the bottom band of the federal funds rate. And so it's like four and a half percent right now uh, that they're getting paid. Literally the only thing in the world that's risk free is getting paid directly by the Fed. And that's what the banks are getting right now for keeping that $2 trillion in cash in the reverse repo facility. At a certain point, that cash will leave the system because the liquidity never lasts forever. And uh, and so uh, we'll, slowly see, we'll slowly see the situation change. And at some point, that $2 trillion will not be in there anymore because the banks will not be in a position where they need collateral anymore. It'll slowly shift to where they need the cash. And so that'll leave the system from the, go into the system from the reverse repo facility. That's about a $2 trillion dollar buffer of liquidity there that's waiting to be used. So we don't have liquidity issues yet in the uh, banking system, but that'll be the first sign that things are changing is when that reverse repo facility starts to drain. And we as taxpayers right now, the Federal Reserve is completely bankrupt, right? So the taxpayers are now paying or Congress is going to have to write a check to the Federal Reserve to pay the interest on that 2.2 trillion, is it right now? 2.1 trillion? which comes out to 35 billion uh, a year? No, so the Federal Reserve still prints that. So this is something that uh, um, some there's there's some misconception about this. So the Federal Reserve has a balance sheet, like everybody has a brokerage account or a retirement account and there's profits in there like dividends. And so uh, you as an individual, you get dividends in your brokerage account, you get to keep that, right? So that's just paying you passive income. Uh, the Federal Reserve has a balance sheet. They've got their brokerage account and it's full of assets like bonds from the government and mortgage-backed securities and they spit off interest to the Federal Reserve. And so that is revenue for the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve also has expenses. So they pay their, you know, 400 PhDs that know nothing. And they also pay uh, interest on all the reserves to banks. Right now, their expenses are way more than their uh, income. And uh, that's because a lot of their assets are paying a very low interest rate because the interest rates were low when the Federal Reserve was buying all those assets. And now interest rates are high. So they're earning a low interest rate on these $9 trillion or $8 trillion of their assets. And they're paying out a much higher interest rate for all their expenses. And so um, they used to be very profitable. Now they're not. When they're profitable, they take all those profits after their expenses, and they just give it back to the federal government, to the treasury, to the federal government there through the treasury. And so it becomes kind of like any any uh, money that the Federal Reserve earns really just goes back to the government. Right now, they're experiencing a loss. 
That doesn't mean, though, that the federal government, the Treasury, is paying the Fed to cover those losses. The Federal Reserve is still printing all that money. They're just kind of like at a at a hole. So it's like they owe they're, they're going to owe back more in profits to the federal government. But right now they're just printing to make up those make up those losses. So we don't have taxpayer funds going to fund the Fed right now. Oh, weird. I could have swore somebody said in one of their videos that the that the Congress is going to have to write the Federal Reserve a check. I thought it was. Um, gosh, what's that guy's name? Steve Van Meter. Do you ever watch him? Steve Van Meter. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a it's a widespread misconception because because of the way that the profits flow, people just assume that when the, the there's a loss at the Fed that it's going the money's going to have to flow the other way. That's not the case. It is uh, the Fed just prints the money to make up the difference. Oh, wow. So then those numbers, what they were implying was wrong. They were saying that over the next six years, as long as those interest rates stay up. So when the interest rates are high, the feds, they're paying interest on the amount of money that's in the reverse repo. But the only purpose is they're not just completely getting rid of the repo because then all that money is going to flood back into the economy. And they don't want that because they want to lower demand. And the idea is to take money out of supply. So they're willing to pay that 4.5%. Exactly. Yeah. So they're trying to uh, decrease demand everywhere they can. And uh, they have got sledgehammers for tools right now. And so one of the sledgehammers is raising interest rates. And so that $2 trillion that's in the reverse repo facility has to find collateral on the open market. It goes out and it buys short-term government debt. And so those interest rates get pushed way down. And that's a stimulus to the economy because borrowing becomes cheaper then. And so in order to stop that from happening, they want to keep that cash in the reverse repo facility so that rates will go up. Because if you could get a risk-free rate of only a half a percent, well, then you have to take on some risk. You're not going to just keep money in a checking account at a half a percent. You're going to put it in the stock market and try and make money that way. But let's just go to the opposite end of the extreme. Let's say you could get 15% just to keep your money in a checking account and 20% to give your money to the government for a year. Well, suddenly the risk of investing in a stock like Apple doesn't seem very attractive because yeah, you might make 12%, but that's not as much as you're gonna make by giving it to the government. And so it reduces the amount of money flowing to economic actors, flowing to productive things, flowing to create things, flowing to spend things, flowing to take debt out and take on risk. It reduces all that economic activity and sucks that money away from the economy, which destroys demand to bring down prices, to bring down inflation. And so that is the goal and the reason why they're uh, why they're keeping that money out of uh, circulation right now, because they're trying to destroy demand still. So they don't want those rates down lower. And we had touched on on inflation earlier. I've been kind of trying to teach people about it. Can you explain in September of 2020, I had bought five dozen eggs for a dollar 16. Now I know you're probably not even going to believe me on that because nobody does, but we went in a live stream <laughs> and I, and I pulled up my receipt, you know, you have like the Walmart shop smart app or whatever, where it keeps track all your receipts. So I, I just happened uh -huh. to have my receipt. So we went through and, and we tallied up, I forget, like picked like 20 items to see what inflation, like what the cost has gone up. Everything was up on the, the lowest. I think something was up was 28. And then my eggs went from a dollar 16 to 1912. So it was like 1800%, right? Now, my mm -hmm. eggs are still 16 or $17. They were a dollar something, right? Even if inflation goes to zero, like say three months from now, inflation 0%, that does not mean that my case of eggs is going to come down whatsoever, correct? So right. they, can, they can print this right. money, inflation goes up, everybody freaks out about it. If they just stop printing money, inflation goes to zero because they lie and they manipulate how inflation is calculated, correct? Yeah, so definitely the official rate of inflation is always going to be understated. I think the real rate of inflation is always at least a few percent higher than the official rate. So when I talk about inflation coming down, I'm talking about the official rate of inflation, I think will potentially hit zero by March. Now, a couple caveats to that. Number one, the rate of inflation is calculated as a basket of goods. And so it's looking at the average of a bunch of things. And so there will be some things that continue to get more expensive. There are other things that will not continue to get more expensive and have not continued to get more expensive. Um, also, the uh, the rate of inflation versus prices. And so this is something that the majority of people don't understand, that if inflation goes from 8% to 1%, that doesn't mean prices fall. It means prices are still going up at a slower pace than before. <laughs> and so that's okay. what we call 
disinflation is like if the inflation rate goes from 8% to 7% to 6%, that's called disinflation. That means that prices are still going up at a slower pace. If inflation is exactly 0%, that just means prices on average are staying the same. That means that we are not experiencing prices going up or down. So for the last couple of years, prices have been going up and up and up and up and up. And I think inflation will hit 0% within a few months, which means that prices will then just stay at the at the current level. And in order for prices to come down and things to get cheaper again, you need deflation to happen. So back to the, the, the Fed's raising interest rates, right? They they are claiming that they are raising interest rates to for what is the point? I mean, isn't it high enough to already have destroyed demand? There can't be anybody that's going to look at and say, oh, interest rates 5% versus 4.5. I'm not going to take out a loan. You know, I, I, it's not going to disenfranchise anybody to, to to borrow less money. If people need to borrow money, it's 4.5%. They're going to borrow it if it's four or five. So what else is going to come from them continuously raising interest rates besides just complete chaos in the economy? Yeah, so not necessarily. So we see the effects that it's had on the housing market. So this is one example where existing home sales have gone to the lowest, uh, second lowest they've ever been. And so nobody is buying and selling homes right now because uh, I've got, let's say, a two and a half percent, three percent mortgage. That means that if I want to buy the exact same house next door, my uh, monthly cost will double because I can't afford the new uh, interest rate on the exact same size loan. And so no one can afford to sell right now because no one can afford to buy. And so interest rates going up specifically with housing has completely halted that entire industry. So you talk about mortgages, you talk about refinancing, you talk about real estate agents, you talk about just the amount of money that people are able to cash out of their homes. You talk about uh, people doing cash out refinances in order to spend that money. All of that uh, halts and goes away. So that's one area. Another area is over leveraged households. So you've got somebody who has been slowly increasing their credit card balance over the last couple of years because it's hard to make ends meet. They got 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 that they're rolling over every month. Now their introductory rates of zero or five or 10% have expired. And now their interest rates go to 20 or 25%. And now interest rates are continuing to go up and their credit card minimum payment is going up every month, even though they're paying their minimum payment. And even though they've stopped adding new money, new balance, uh, increasing their balance, they're not doing that anymore. Their minimum payment are still going up because the interest rate is going up. And so when you have an over leveraged economy and you start to increase the interest rates, as you roll, all over that debt, it gets harder and harder to pay. And so you have to devote more and more income just to paying the debt. And that income to pay the debt gets sucked away from the economy. So you can't spend that income now on other things. So even though four and a half, five percent interest rates, they're low, historically speaking, we're extremely over leveraged. And so the effects of that are massive.